Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is the Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Hello and welcome to you all. The Andrew Lawton Show here on True North on this Thursday, March 14th. I believe it is, uh, my math is a little rusty because, it, well, it was never good to begin with, but I believe it is Pi Day. Uh, is it not? March 14th, 314, 3.1415, something, something. I, I lose track at five, but uh, uh, Sean will, Sean's already going in the chat, so he'll actually be just typing out the uh, digits of pi until the end of the show. Uh, so if a clip doesn't play, that's why, but uh, we're, we're, we'll be up to like, you know, digit 97 or something. But anyway, pie day notwithstanding, I'm uh, usually more into a different type of pie, uh, not as infinite as the mathematical pie, but I wanted to pick up where we started off talking yesterday it was kind of a last minute change. I called an audible because moments before the show began, my colleague, True North's Alberta reporter and host of Alberta Roundup, Rachel Emanuel, uh, was very, I, I would say, rudely given the bums rush out of an Alberta a technical college when Justin Trudeau was holding a press conference. He was addressing media, but only certain type of media, not True North and not uh, Counter Signal, which is run by Key and Bexty. Uh, this was a rather shameful display, but as I remarked yesterday on the show, not all that unsurprising. I've had my own run-ins with uh, Trudeau's bodyguards in the past who have uh, barred me from getting close to him, even where other journalists are permitted. Uh, True North, you may recall, in 2019 actually had to sue our way in to the leaders' debate. This was not a Liberal Party event. This was a Government of Canada-run event, the official election leaders' debate. We won, but it shows the lengths through which uh, Trudeau and his minions do not want any independent journalists questioning them. We uh, were trying to get uh, Rachel Emanuel on the show yesterday, but I think she was actually in a dead sprint to get away from the RCMP uh, when the show was on. But she she did it, and she joins us now. Rachel, good to talk to you. I, I was exaggerating a little bit there, but but you actually did have quite a, a serious encounter that started with the college's security and ended up with, I think, Calgary Police and RCMP, did you not? Yeah, I mean, it actually started even before that. Initially, earlier in the day, we had gotten word that Trudeau was at a hotel in Calgary. Eventually, we narrowed it down to the Sheraton. You know, you can kind of drive by the hotels, keep a look out for additional security, unmarked, you know, big black vehicles outside of them, things like that. A lot of times these vehicles also have Ontario license plates. So we knew a little bit what to look for. So we figured that he was meeting Alberta Premier Daniel Smith at the Sheraton. And, you know, we headed on into the hotel there, into the lobby. We're very quickly asked to leave you know, maybe we should have worn some security uniforms or something to look like we belong. You know, fair enough. We waited outside. Uh, we caught Danielle Smith on her way out of a side exit there, and she was happy to give us a couple questions quickly. Of course, Alberta Premier Danielle Smith often speaks with media. She's very fair about that, and she also speaks to all types of media, not just independent reporters or conservative reporters, those that would tend to be a little bit more supportive of her policies. Then, you know, we were waiting in a vehicle so we could follow Trudeau's motorcade so we could get the location of his press conference. And even while we were simply sitting in our vehicle waiting for the motorcade to leave, police was already giving us a hard time. Oh, you can't wait here. Oh, you can't park. You have to move over there. You have to move over here. Once the motorcade left, you know, police vehicles driving in front of us very slowly. So we couldn't, you know, get around them, get, get closer to the motorcade. Of course, then we were listening to the press conference. Once the question period of the press conference started, the moderator said the first question is going to go to the sate reporter and that's when keen put it together oh they're at sate so we went to sate sure enough there we see his motorcade so we're just kind of waiting waiting in the building there for him to come down we were going to just try to ask him some questions as he walked over to his motorcade and uh then you know rcmp calgary police they're all there they're all giving us a very hard time as soon as we walked out of that building we were listening to the press conference and we figured eh, once it comes close to an end we'll walk out we'll wait near the motorcade so that we can get our questions in as he you know it's a mere 30 seconds 10 seconds maybe even he's walking from the building to his motorcade we've all seen the clips of reporters following him from buildings to vehicles and even that you know they take issue with they start moving the vehicles wow. so that we can't even get a view of him and then the police starts being like you got to move further back you got to move back you Know, they're trying to push us back at us as far as way as you can. You can see a little gap between the vehicles and the clip that you're playing. And that was basically as close as we were going to get. And even that they were, you know, frustrated with. They kept trying to push us back, make things difficult for us. It was one of the most pathetic displays I've ever seen. And you can only think to yourself, imagine if they use this kind of energy to actually fix some of the actual countries, <laughs> some of the issues that we have going on in our country, things would look a whole lot better. And then of course, just, I, I think it was probably three minutes before he finally finished that press conference and came out. 
uh, state security came up to us and said, nope, you know, we don't want you to be here. You're not accredited media. You have to leave. And once they say it's a trespassing issue, you do have to leave very quickly or you will be charged with trespassing. That's about a $300 fine. I know that Kian has run into that issue with the past during the general election when independent media had these same issues with, you know, trying to go to NDP press conferences. So then it gets a little more dodgy and, you know, trespassing charge isn't the most serious of things, but I think best to avoid it if you can. Yeah, I mean, some journalists, I guess, probably collect them as, as a badge of honor. But at, at a certain point, if the prime minister rents out a hotel ballroom, uh, for all intents and purposes, that's private property and the hotel ballroom could uh, trespass you. So I, I get why uh, you you moved outside there. Same thing happened when I was uh, kicked out of, uh, uh, what was it, Laurentian University in Thunder Bay, uh, trying to attend a Trudeau event. Once they say it's private property and you can't be here, it doesn't matter that Trudeau's there or not. I, but I would actually say it, it goes beyond, it goes earlier than the Sheridan, because you would done the thing that you're supposed to do uh, the night before you requested accreditation. But they do this thing now where they on, on Trudeau's itinerary, they don't even announce where the event is going to be. Uh, you have to request accreditation and they uh, try to basically make it so that no one can do what you did by just not responding. So they, they made a concerted effort early on that you were not going to be permitted. Absolutely. And just to give your audience a full picture of what's going on behind the scenes there is they've really started to lock these events down that Trudeau is at. They do not want people to know where he is. They do not want protesters showing up. Trudeau is hated in Canada right now and especially in the West. And people tend to find out where these events are happening. They tend to find out where he's staying and they go and protest. And so we've seen them really up the ante and trying to keep these things secret. I sent out a lot of requests. A lot of people in the province who are always in the know did not know where either of these events were happening. They didn't know where the meeting with the premier was happening and they didn't know where that dental care announcement was happening. So things were really under wraps this time. And we just saw the police go to that extra effort just to make sure that two little journalists wouldn't be able to even so much as ask the prime minister a question because that would be too much of a nuisance for our beloved prime minister. And we couldn't offend his ears with, you know, some, some conservative journalists asking him some questions. We saw something similar with the Alberta NDP. They really tried hard to keep their press conferences and their announcements under wraps. But in that case, they were also trying to get the word out to have other people come. So they didn't do so very effectively. And we typically found them in advance. But it's going to be interesting to see what future visits from the prime minister to Calgary look like, because I think they've decided this is the new model that they're going to use, where they're just going to be super secretive. We even we couldn't even get information from the premier's office. The premier's office said, no, we can't share this. That would be a breach of security contract with the prime minister's office. So they were taking this very seriously as well. And I was a little bit like, well, what's the prime minister ever done for Alberta? <laughs> yeah. Has he earned that? Has he earned that from them? Just to go to the policy aspect here, we, we've seen this week, and I'll, I'll be talking about it in a moment, this carbon tax revolt being waged by seven of 10 uh, provincial premiers so far. Ground zero for that has really been Alberta. So to some extent, I mean, Trudeau yesterday was in the, the belly of the beast here, but absolutely unrepentant when he asked. He went on, I think it was like some eight minute long rant uh, defending the carbon tax yesterday at that presser, didn't he? Pretty remarkable. I mean, Justin Trudeau is someone who doesn't learn his lessons. He's someone who doesn't care what the Canadian people think. We understand that because he chooses to stay at the most expensive hotels wherever he travels. This has been a controversy for the prime minister time and time again. He simply does not care about the cost of his luxury lifestyle that he's passing on to taxpayers. That's one thing that's been incredibly obvious for us. Another thing is even the simple fact that he won't allow a regular person like myself into his press conferences to ask questions because I'm not considered an elite accredited media. I'm honestly just a mom. I've got a very successful podcast, one of the most listened to shows in Alberta, if not the most popular political podcast in the province. And he isn't even willing to give me so much as a question or to allow me to enter a room that he's in or probably even look in the same direction as him if we're being honest. So this is a prime minister who generally hates Canadians. And so I'm not surprised that he's not budging on the carbon tax. Something I will say that is interesting is that I had Cheryl out on my show, the Alberta Roundup yesterday. She used to be the director of communications for former Alberta Premier Rachel Notley, who, as we know, is resigning once a new leader is selected. And she said that the carbon tax is poison in Alberta right now. It's an extremely unpopular policy. She said that while she agrees with what the policy is kind of trying to accomplish, it's just not going to be very feasible for politicians in Alberta right now. So here we even have uh, someone who worked for the Alberta NDP signaling the fact that this is a policy that's really a no-go right now. So even she can kind of understand this is something we need to change direction on, but not Trudeau because this is a man who is unwilling to admit when he's wrong. 
Uh, very well said, Rachel Emanuel. Glad you uh, emerged unscathed. No handcuffs, no trespassing ticket, but uh, good on you for trying. Uh, maybe he'll take uh, some time before returning to Alberta because of your efforts. So uh, appreciate your time as always, Rachel. Happy to be here. See you guys. All right. Thank you for that. And just on the provincial aspect here, I, I wanted to talk about this because this is quite a significant issue. We're talking about this carbon tax revolt that has been waged by seven of 10 premiers right now. So uh, the premier of Alberta, Danielle Smith, the premier of Saskatchewan, Scott Moe. I shouldn't commit to naming them all because I, I usually get a little foggy uh, when I get to Atlantic Canada. But no, I got, I think I know I can do them all. I'm going to do it. All right. Uh, we have Alberta premier, Danielle Smith, Saskatchewan premier, Scott Moe. We have Ontario Premier Doug Ford. Uh, oh, I'm already losing track. No. Uh, and then we have Newfoundland Premier Andrew Fury. We have Dennis King in PEI. We have Blaine Higgs in New Brunswick and Tim Houston in Nova Scotia. That is seven right there. The other three, uh, David Eby, Wab Canoe, and uh, of course, Francois Legault from BC, Manitoba, and Quebec, respectively, are the lone three. Sean was trying to give me cheat, uh, notes, by the way. I, I didn't, I want it known I didn't even look at them. I did those all by memory. Uh, sometimes I call Anthony Fury. The the premier of Newfoundland, though, which I'm, I'm not sure either uh, appreciates uh, the confusion on. But uh, only three premiers have not done what those seven have done. And th those are the, the premiers of BC, Manitoba, and Quebec, which are all very much all in. Uh, well, Manitoba is a bit of a weird case, but Quebec and BC are all in on the carbon tax. The other seven some liberals and some conservatives in there are saying, hey, we need to give our people a break. We need to give our people a break. And it's fascinating to me that it's been this issue that has united uh, politicians from different party stripes. Uh, one of the galvanizing forces has been this increase to the carbon tax, which is coming in uh, September, or sorry, coming April 1st. So just uh, two weeks from now, the carbon tax is going up yet again. And it has several increases built in. After this year, it's going to continue to increase. And Wab Canoe, so yesterday he was pushed on this because Manitobans, I mean, Manitoba is not a warm place. No one says let's uh, vacation in balmy Manitoba. It is a very cold place. So Wab Canoe knows full well that the people he represents are grappling with the cost of the carbon tax. It's also a very rural place. People need to drive to get around. There's no big subway that goes from Winnipeg to Churchill so that uh, people can just take public transit. This is a significant challenge, but he won't even say whether or not he has asked the government to put the brakes on the increase. Take a look at this clip. Well, we've been very clear that Manitoba has a really strong case to make in terms of the carbon uh, backstop not being applied in our province, and that's because Manitobans have made huge investments in renewable power, and we have a, a low carbon uh, energy source here in Manitoba. So our province has taken action to help you. We've cut the provincial gas tax, that's 14 cents a litre, that you save every time you gas up. And so we're going to continue to make life more affordable for people. Sorry, uh, my, my, my question was, uh, will you ask the federal government to cancel the planned carbon increase? Well, no? we've made a very clear statement on an ongoing basis that Manitoba has a really strong case to make. And we're going to continue to make that case that we don't need the, uh, the backstop here in Manitoba. So you will ask them not, not to? You're going to make a formal request? Who's to say we haven't? Oh, well, that would be an assumption. Have you? That have would you? be an assumption. <laughs> have, have you? <laughs> have you made that request? You know, conversations that we have with the federal level are uh, private until we decide to make them public. Will you ask the federal government to pause the carbon tax increase? Who's to say we haven't? Okay, well, have you? Oh, that, that's confidential. I can't say it. So he won't even say whether he's had a conversation with the federal government asking them for relief on the carbon tax. Now, this is perhaps the NDP in Manitoba getting a little bit of pressure from its federal NDP friends, maybe not wanting to make them look bad. Uh, Alberta NDP leadership candidates right now are completely against the carbon tax. It's been fascinating to see that even the left-wing NDP in Alberta knows it cannot sell a carbon tax to people in that province. So none of those people vying for the leadership of the NDP, which is already a bit of a thankless job. You've got folks like Sarah Hoffman there and now Nahid Nenshi entering the race. Uh, they're all saying, yeah, we, we most of them, not all, are saying, well, we think the carbon tax is toxic, so we are not going to run on that. 
Now, in spite of this, when seven of 10 first ministers in the Federation are saying to the prime minister, you've got to stop this, this is, in, in my view, verging on a crisis in federalism for a piece of legislation whose constitutionality is already a little bit dubious. I mean, yes, the Supreme Court has upheld the carbon tax, but it was on very narrow grounds that they ultimately sided with the government's argument that this was a matter of federal jurisdiction. So politically, morally, Justin Trudeau should be making a much greater appeal to his provincial counterparts who are not meant to be subordinates. They're meant to be, uh, it's meant to be where the Justin Trudeau prime minister role right now is the first among equals. He has his domain, the provincial premiers has their domain, but instead he looks at them as minions that have to do his bidding when he orders a carbon tax on the beleaguered residents of those governments that were not putting forward policies of that nature. Now, Scott Moe in Saskatchewan, they've, I think, been the most aggressive because they've actually just stopped paying the government. They have stopped remitting the tax. This was a Trudeau's response to that yesterday. Given that Saskatchewan has decided not to uh, rebate uh, the carbon tax, um, there's been some question over possible penalties over the Saskatchewan Premier breaking the law. Uh, it's something that uh, Danielle Smith has been worried about as well. And it all seems to kind of come back to the carve out for the home heating oil back in Atlantic Canada. So the question is, is what would these consequences be for not rebating the tax? On the decision by the government of Saskatchewan to not pay its taxes to the federal government. As we've seen from a few different premiers, you can use the notwithstanding clause to opt out of basic charter rights of Canadians. I think it's a bad idea, but a number of people are doing it. You can opt out of the Charter of Rights of Freedoms by using the notwithstanding clause. But you can't opt out of the Federation. You can't opt out of Canada. We, have, we are a country of laws. We're a country of rules and responsibilities and it was it's evolved over 150 plus years to be this extraordinarily successful country we have and we expect people to obey the law that's what governments expect of their citizens that's what citizens should expect of their governments he says you can't opt out of the Federation, but that's exactly what he's doing by taking such a scornful and disdainful view of the provinces. Again, there many of them are not even saying get rid of the carbon tax altogether. They're saying, hey, maybe you cool it on the increase, on just adding insult to injury, rubbing salt in the wound, uh, kicking them when they're down, pick your cliche, pick your metaphor. But he, they're saying ju just don't do the increase. That Just don't increase the gas tax, the carbon tax, the heating tax, the cost of living even further in two weeks. Give us a break is what they're saying. And he's saying, eh, eh doesn't matter. And, and when provincial premiers like Danielle Smith, like the environment minister in Alberta, Rebecca Schultz, both of whom have been on the show many times, have said they cannot even have a relationship with the federal environment minister, Stephen Gilbo, uh, this is what Justin Trudeau says about those concerns. In regards to my my uh, my environment minister, I have tremendous faith and confidence uh, in my environment minister. Uh, and if you know, if people are having a trouble getting along with them, maybe they need to look at their own uh, approach to uh, these big issues, as opposed to uh, looking at what he's talking about, which is uh, consistent with building a better future for everyone. Oh, isn't that nice? It's right up there with Albertans should elect more liberal MPs if they want a seat at the table. It's well, if uh, people can't work with Stephen Gilbo, that's their problem, not his, not ours, not mine. Justin Trudeau is saying it's his way or the highway, except there's no highway because Stephen Gilbo wants to effectively ban roads. So uh, tough for all of us here. Let's delve into this with Colin Craig. He is the president of secondstreet.org, which does a lot of tremendous work on healthcare, which is, I, I think, at its core, a federalism debate that takes place. And I know he's also done work on uh, carbon taxes and the like as well. Colin, good to talk to you. Thanks for, for coming on today. I, just before we delve into the meat of the carbon tax stuff, what do you make of this fractured relationship between provinces and the government? We're not just talking here about, you know, one lone renegade Western premier that is having difficulty with a Trudeau policy. You've got seven of 10 premiers representing the majority of the population and of the provinces that are saying to the government, stop doing this thing. 
Well, look, it's always interesting and, and entertaining when a policy you think is uh, a failure uh, starts to fail and everyone can see it, uh, at least almost everyone. I mean, it, at, at its core, the carbon tax is bad public policy. There, there's no doubt about it. The way that the federal government has gone about this, it's bad public policy. It's failing. I think most politicians uh, are able to s smell that out. They can see it's bad policy. It's, it's not a good decision. And so they're rebelling. Like you said, at the provincial level, you've got all these premiers. You said seven. I think there's a case to argue that Wab Canoes so maybe seven and a half, eight, because, uh, I mean, he's basically rejected the policy by cutting their own provincial uh, gas tax to give Manitobans some breathing room there. So, you know, I think you've got most politicians in the country realizing and saying this is a bad policy. You, you got to back away from it. Canadians are struggling right now. Businesses are struggling. Certainly many of them are. Um, and yet you've got the, the prime minister just going full steam ahead on a, a really uh, bad policy. It's bad politics too, Andrew. I mean, look, he's down and out in the polls. He's way behind. Uh, cost of living is the number one issue, and he just keeps raising taxes. Like it, it's a bad, bad decision politically. It's bad economically. Um, it is what it is now. Well, and, and look, I, I ran for office once uh, previously, and one of the things that uh, that really stood out to me was that of all the you know thousands and thousands of doors I knocked on and people I spoke to, when I asked you know what your number one issue was, uh, only one person out of I think twenty two thousand doors said environment. And that's not to say it's not an issue that matters. It's not to say it's an issue that matters to people, but it, it tends to be issues like that, in my experience, tend to be secondary when your house is on fire. And by that, I mean your economic house, when you right. can't afford groceries, when you can't afford to fill up your car. A lot of these things look like luxury items. And I, I think it would be reasonable for the government to say, listen, we, we think that, uh, it, just to use their own framing for a moment, I think that uh, climate is really important. I think carbon tax is the best way to get there. However, I realize that right now Canadians are struggling. We're going to just put a pause on this while still committing to the overall policy and objective. But the issue is they know if they do that, they're going to have to be the ones that reintroduce it at a certain point. But you're, you're right that it's bad politics also, because right now you have seven, seven and a half fingers pointing at the federal government saying, you guys are the reason that people are having to deal with this increase. And that's not something they had when they first sold this policy. No, it's not. I mean, let's step back for a second here. When has a prime minister in this country created a tax for everyone else but himself? I mean, there, there's probably only a handful of people in this country that don't really have to pay the, the, the carbon tax. The prime minister. Why? Because you and I and all your viewers and all the taxpayers in this country pay to heat his residence. So he's not paying the carbon tax when he has to heat his residence. Uh, he's not filling up any car at the pumps like the rest of us, right? He gets chauffeured around. Someone's always paying for his transportation. He doesn't have to pay for it there. I mean, taxpayers pay, I believe, for some of his groceries and meals and so forth. So he's essentially created this tax that he doesn't have to pay. Everyone else does. And, and so that could be part of why he doesn't understand why so many people are upset. Never mind the fact that he's making close to $400,000 a year. He's got a golden pension and so forth. I mean, he's not feeling this issue the same way that everyday Canadians are. His cabinet certainly isn't either. I mean, they're extremely well paid. Again, golden pension and so forth. They don't have to feel that. But, you know, I think media need to maybe point that out to him. The second thing is why I think this is failing is just look at his own behavior. Right. I mean, since he declared a, a climate emergency in Parliament, he's traveled to Costa Rica twice. He's traveled down to Jamaica twice. He's flown to Montana. He's gone to Tofino a couple times. Like, I mean, he's flying all over the place in the government's private jet. And I don't think anyone can begrudge a, a prime minister for wanting to have some vacation time. But he is saying that there's a climate emergency and he is routinely getting into an airplane, flying all over the place and creating all kinds of unnecessary emissions by his own standard. So, I mean, he is just demonstrating that the carbon tax has failed or else he would have changed his own behavior and he hasn't. So Yeah, and, and that's the problem is that there tends to be from defenders of the carbon tax a, a significant overstatement 
of how many of these carbon emitting things are are uh, are optional or elective for people. I mean, if you live in the country and you've got to drive your kids to school uh, 50, 50 minutes or something, or if you have to drive to work a certain distance, or if you need to buy groceries for your family, I mean, th these are not discretionary things. So uh, the average Canadian is forced to just look at the increased price and say, okay, I guess I'm paying that and not say, mm, well, you know, maybe I'm only going to drive three quarters of the way to school this morning. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. You talked about Manitoba before. I'm, I'm from there originally. I mean, it gets extremely freezing cold in the winter. It's not like you can, as you just noted, you can't just go, yeah, maybe we'll go without heat this winter. No, you'll die. You'll die if you don't have proper heat in, in Manitoba in the winter. I mean, we just, for our TV show, we did an episode on heat pumps recently, and people keep talking about heat pumps. Very fascinating technology. Uh, maybe it gets better in the future, but you're not surviving in Manitoba all winter on a heat pump. It just won't work. You need to have that natural gas component. Maybe a heat pump can help a bit, but we're not there. I mean, we need these things like natural gas to heat our homes. We need things like gasoline to power our vehicles and so forth. I mean, the idea that we're all switching to electric cars anytime soon, that's, that's fantasy. Um, they cost a fortune and, you know, a lot of households are struggling right now to get by and never mind having to drop $50,000 or whatever on an electric car. Like, this doesn't add up, Andrew. No, it uh, certainly does not. Colin Craig from secondstreet.org, uh, great work there. I, I wanted to ask you briefly, uh, just while I had you here, about Mark mm -hmm. Holland, because uh, I know this he, he got under your, uh, under your skin this past <laughs> week, I think. He did, yeah. I mean, he's just he's another example, I think, of how the elite in this country are often detached from everyday people. I mean, if you're a politician, you got a lot of money and resources. If you ever face a long wait time in the healthcare system, you can go abroad. You don't have to worry about it. And he was kind of poo pooing people that do that and and saying like it's it's not necessary. We can't allow that to happen in Canada. Blah blah blah. But the reality is, a lot of people are suffering in this country. It's not just the wealthy that are going abroad. I mean, we're talking all the time with middle income people who are doing it. They're suffering. They're living with chronic, chronic pain and people can't do that for a year or two. It's inhumane. So we need health reform. We need a mature discussion about this in this country to see, start to see these reforms happen. And Ottawa's approach is, let's just throw more money at the healthcare system and hope things work out. And it, it's not adding up. I mean, we got to move beyond this simply throwing money at the system stage and, and Mark Colin, I don't think it's the minister to, to take us there. Colin Craig, thank you very much, sir. Thanks, Andrew. Always appreciate the chat. All right, likewise. One of the most worrying trends we have seen in Canada in the last couple of years has been the weaponization of the judicial process and how, first off, absent the judicial process is when it comes to matters of civil liberty. But even when you look at the way that certain cases are prosecuted, we've all seen stories of this revolving door for people that are arrested for very violent or very despicable offenses, and they find themselves out on bail uh, basically immediately. And then you have, in contrast with that, cases like that of Tamara Leach and Chris Barber, uh, two of the organizers of the Freedom Convoy who were arrested in February 2022, didn't go on trial until September 2023, and we are now six months later, and their trial is still underway with, with no immediately discernible or identified end in sight. Now, in the case of Tamara Leach, she languished behind bars, I think it was for about 49 days, if memory serves, whereas Chris Barber was fortunate enough to get released on bail not long after his arrest. But the cases of both of them, I think, raise significant questions about whether there is a, politicized, a politicization of the prosecution. Uh, you look in contrast to the case in Coots 4. Now, this is a, a bit of a trickier one because there has been, for a lot of this, a publication ban around key details. So I haven't actually been able to talk about a lot of the case because of this limitation. But what we do know is that two of the Coots 4 were released on lesser charges. Uh, the other two are still incarcerated, have been denied bail, and they are awaiting trial on charges of a conspiracy to kill police officers. Again, very serious charges, but they, like anyone else, have a right to their day in court. But I've heard more than ever before in the time I've covered crime and justice issues, people that simply do not trust the justice system. And there was a fascinating essay in the C2C Journal about the worrying, the worrisome wave 
of politicized prosecutions. It was written by Gwyn Morgan, who is a legend in the Canadian oil and gas sector. He was the CEO of Encana back when, well, back when it was Encana and also back when it was a Canadian company. And he's always been a tremendous supporter of True North. Uh, Gwyn Morgan, good to have you back on the show. Thank you so much for your time. Can you hear me, Gwyn? I don't know if you can hear me. I hear I, I hear noise coming from your end. All right, we'll have to uh, sort out that <coughs> audio issue there and get Gwyn back. But uh, this is a, an essay that was a, a very fascinating and, and very evocative read. And it's always important when you're writing about or reporting on justice issues to separate someone's crime or alleged crime from your assessment of the justice system itself. And, and it's the same as when you talk about free speech, you need to be able to talk about the essence of free speech and the importance of free speech and, and do so in a way that is uh, dispassionate compared to the individual expressions. But at, at the other side of that, you have to also look at just the fundamental principles of, of justice. And, and what are the rights people have? People have a right to face their accuser. They have a right to know what their charges are. They have a right to see the case against them. And crucially, they have a right to a speedy trial. Now, I, I don't pretend to be a lawyer. I've, I've covered a lot of cases and I, I've picked up some of the legal principles along the way. But when you have cases that last years and someone is denied bail in that time period, and no one has seen the case against them. It makes it very difficult for the public, which is supposed to have, the, the public needs to hold the justice system in repute for the uh, justice system to have any legitimacy whatsoever. You have people in the public that are unable to really deal with this. And it's not to say that the court of public opinion is driving the real court process and the real legal process. But if you don't have confidence in the system, if you don't have confidence in the process, the process itself just is basically meaningless. And that's when you have cases where uh, people are protesting outside courts because they they just believe that everyone is uh, co-opted. And again, it's an amusing story, but I think it's relevant to this. Uh, this week, there was a, a Supreme Court decision and the Supreme Court decision was, uh, it, it had a paragraph that was just one of the most bizarrely worded, sloppily worded paragraphs in which uh, Justice Sheila Martin, who was appointed by Justin Trudeau, I think in 2017, no, I don't. It, it came up uh, you had uh, right Sheila away, Martin so say that says, a woman says, uh, was I'm, a I'm confusing not, not word. And instead of using woman, you should use the less confusing person with a vagina. And this was summarily mocked by a lot of observers. Then people said, well, no, she didn't say that. What she actually meant was this. And, and it kind of underscores the confusion there because someone's reading what is officially law in Canada now, part of a Supreme Court decision, and they can't seem to agree on what it's all about. And then you had uh, the Supreme Court, the female justices on the Supreme Court last week on International Women's Day, March 8th, they were all posing for this photo and the accompanying tweet was basically talking about gender-based appointments to the court instead of merit-based appointments. And again, how can you have confidence in the justice system when this is the type of rhetoric that courts are putting out? And to bring, bring it back into the COVID realm for a moment, you may recall there was a, a case in, uh, well, it wasn't a case, it was an interview. I think it was with Le Devoir. It was a, a French language publication that the Chief Justice, uh, Richard Wagner, did. And, and in that interview, he was speaking about the Freedom Convoy and spoke about Ottawa being under siege. He spoke about these, uh, basically this lawlessness, I think anarchy, He used, I think he used the word anarchy in the streets of Ottawa. And here you have a case where, okay, the chief justice is playing political pundit now. How is he to respond when a case about the Freedom Convoy invariably goes before the Supreme Court? And how are people supposed to have confidence in his decision when he has already given his personal opinion about this thing that may be at the core of a case? So I, I think there are plenty of reasons that people can and are uh, can distrust and, and are generally distrustful of the justice system and of the justice process, but it brings about the bigger question of how do you restore that trust, especially when it looks like there is a politicization underway and, and there is politicking going on in what is supposed to be, again, reason free from passion. The old line, I believe it was Aristotle said, or at least is often attributed to Aristotle. I realized I, I learned it was Aristotle from Legally Blonde, and I'm not sure if uh, Legally Blonde had accurately quoted him, but nevertheless. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> legally blonde notwithstanding this is why i'm not a lawyer because i just quote reese, uh, reese witherspoon chick flicks when i'm talking about the law but all of that notwithstanding we have gwen morgan back on we've sorted out the gremlins in the system here gwen uh good to have you back on thanks for coming today oh thank you and the reason i have this passion I, i'm not trying to be like the old Captain Morgan, the pirate. It's it's really because I just had an eye operation. I have to have it on for a few days. All right. Well, I hope you're healing up, and I appreciate you not letting it get in the way of our uh, our interview that's scheduled today. But so you've delved into this incredibly important issue here in, in the politicization of the political process. And I, I'm always clear to say that you know we, we have to see in, in some of these cases, which are still ongoing, what the courts are going to find and, and what the facts are. But why was this bothering you so much, looking at this from the sidelines? Well, when you look, when you look at this whole situation, when you talk about the truckers convoy. Uh, the prosecution of them. There's been eight persons associated with the convoys, both in, at Coots and in, in Ottawa, who have served nine years in jail with a, without parole, with which what now a judge has ruled is not even a crime. And yet, you know, we, we open the papers every few days and we see a violent, somebody killed by a, a, someone released on the catch and release system committing a murder. A horrible murder. And, and so the only explanation for this, Andrew, is political in interference in the justice system. And I think it starts at the top. Do you think, let's say unpack that for a moment, because do you think the issue is that there is a case of, of judges taking their marching orders, perhaps not explicitly, but implicitly from political leaders? Or do you think it's just in who's getting appointed to the bench? Do you think it's just that uh, leaders are appointing judges of a certain political persuasion and, and this is just their bias on display? Well, there's no doubt about the first part, about the last part of that. I mean, the, the Supreme Court, uh, the head of the Supreme Court, just a recent, uh, he's been he's been a, uh, appointed by the by the the, the uh, uh, by Trudeau, and so uh, the, the the court is. There's no question the Supreme Court is is now politicized to an extent that probably never before. Yeah, and, and you had mentioned in your piece the, the story that I just shared on the show a moment ago of him doing an interview. And I mean, the idea of, of Supreme Court justices doing interviews, I, I think, is problematic for a number of reasons. This is one of them. But he, he gives his opinion about this issue that like anyone knows is going to end up before him as a case in some form, whether it's someone appealing their criminal charge or whether it's the Emergencies Act going before the Supreme Court. But he's already now put on record that he believes the Freedom Convoy was holding people hostage. So how is he expected to set that aside when he makes an adjudication on the convoy or a re case related to it? He can't be expected and he won't. That's the problem. I mean, we've had what we've had is is eight persons arrested uh, for participation in freedom convoys, and they have served nine years, nine years in jail without parole for something that now has been ruled not even a, a, it's not even it's been ruled by a recent judge. It's not even a crime. So where, where do you think this issue started or when do you think it started? Because I, I would say that there have probably been, I, I think that the issues are a lot more explicit and in your face now, but I, I don't think this is a new phenomenon. I, I wouldn't even argue, and you may disagree, Gwen, that I wouldn't even argue it started with Justin Trudeau. Well, I don't know. It, it seems like that's such a long time ago. I, 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 <laughs> my friend Stephen Harper would, would have, wouldn't have had anything like this. So I, I think that the whole deterioration of the system is, is, is consistent with their Trudeau uh, reign and the, his actions on the Freedom Con on the on the uh, the, the uh, Emergencies Act itself were now now seen to be as unnecessary and possibly illegal. Yeah, and, and you had mentioned, just to go back to that point we were discussing a few moments ago about, you know, whether this is, you know, whether they're picking up implicit signals, these judges, or or getting direct interference. No one seems interested in asking. I mean, that, that's the, the lack of curiosity from some of my colleagues in the media about these issues has been quite, maybe not astonishing, but disappointing. Well, one of the things in my column I spend quite a bit of time was how the terrible treatment of Tamara Leach. Mm -hmm. uh, who's a, an indigenous woman who went to help out with the communications and, and, and organization of the convoy, but she never committed a crime. And she has been persecuted continuously. And one of the things, and, and, and her case is still going on. She's been, 
it's still going on today and, and, and uh, the trial will resume soon. Uh, and yet this woman has been uh, per persecuted beyond reason. And, and because uh, uh, that can only happen if there's direction from the top. Well, and the thing I would also point out in, in the case of Tamara Leach is that like the argument for keeping her behind bars, because she spent, she I think it was 19 days she was released and then rearrested for another 30 days. So I, I think 49 was the total. I might be, you know, give or take one or two. But she, I mean, she was unvaccinated. She couldn't board a plane. She wasn't a flight risk. Uh, she wasn't violent. She wasn't at risk to reoffend because the protest was over. Like there, there was no defensible reason to keep her incarcerated. And especially when you contrast it with all of these catch and release policies that you've alluded to, where people who are reoffending are are being just sent out of jail immediately after their arrest. Well, this is a, a petite woman who who uh, <laughs> was 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 charged with uh, committing the offenses of, of obstructing police officers and danger and endangering the public. This is this little woman, and she was marched to the to a jail, thrown down into a cell where. Uh, and then, and then eventually it put into another part of the jail system and back and forth and her trial still going on. She's still being persecuted. And the pr prosecutor himself, they said, that they want to make a special case uh, to show teacher a lesson. And when that happens, uh, you, how can that otherwise happen without some, if either implicit or explicit interaction? Well and, and that's an important point, because I, ideally, if you are, I, I mean, yes, sentencing is, is in, a, in a roundabout way meant to be a deterrent. But when you're on trial, you want the case to be about you and your conduct and your actions, not you as a symbol for society that the prosecution wants to punish. And they have done that with Tamara, and they've been very explicit about that. They, they don't want to just put her on trial. They want to put the whole convoy on trial through her. Well, I, I think that's exactly right. And, and, you know, you probably saw that recently a judge came out and actually ruled that there was no crime committed. With a, with the freedom convoy protest. yeah well that the, the yeah that that it wasn't an emergency the the federal court decision that you know basically the entire premise of this national emergency just did not yeah. exist yeah. yeah no very very well said it was a great uh, piece in C two C journal called the worrisome wave of politicized prosecutions I don't I don't think you could hear me when I I did my initial introduction but I I said you were a legend in oil and gas and I'm uh, grateful for your work at the helm of En Canada which is uh, neither a Canadian nor called En Canada anymore so uh, you're uh, representative for the glory days of, of that. But Gwen Morgan, always good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on. Thank, today. thank you, Andrew. All right. And thanks for your uh, support of True North as well. It's very much appreciated. That does it for us for today. We'll be back to, well, no, we won't be back tomorrow. I'll be back on Off the Record tomorrow, but uh, the Andrew Lawton Show resumes on Monday. So have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Thank you. God bless and good day to you all. To the Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.